Just getting in on a meeting. You're all right. I do want to stay here. Mm. Um, is there a meeting today for short term rentals? Right now. Oh, uh, Mr. Cooper. Do they need to know if you email that? Yeah, Zoom only. Yep. Uh, and the site. It's online. Yep, it's on our online website. There should be an agenda posted media. outside in the town hall, too. Okay. Yep. Greetings, everyone. Welcome, everyone. We're just getting started here and allowing people in before we uh, kick it off. But thank you all for attending. There's an economic development committee meeting happening now. Wow. Back to the uh, So. Yeah, the budget for some new shades, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We're just still letting people come in, so just give us a couple minutes. Hi, Ann. Good to see you again. Hi, everybody. I literally said to someone in my meeting before this, I was like, I got to go to Millinocket. And they literally thought I was getting in the car. <laughs> and just like that, you were here. Like, oh. Yep. Magic. Power of Zoom. Michelle, good to see you. Uh, congratulations on your position with our Katahdin. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. She said likewise to you, Peter, but I didn't ah. unmute it. Yeah. Sir, well, thank you as well. <clears throat> and Matt, is that you calling in on the phone there? It is, yes. I'm on my way home. I'll be jumping on my uh, computer in about five minutes. No problem. Just want to make sure I got everyone's name accounted for. Thank you. All right, so it looks like uh, most of us are here. So we'll just get started here. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. It's nice to see a lot of participation for uh, committee meetings. Uh, we do a lot of work behind the scenes, although we're obviously always open to the public, but it's nice to see people participate. And uh, basically, our role is to make uh, recommendations to the town council. So we don't make any decisions here. We only make recommendations. The town council is the only body that can actually approve any of these decisions. Um, we just do a lot of legwork research, uh, you know, reaching out to the community to get input and things like that. Um, discussions like short-term rentals, which I'm sure is the reason a lot of you are here, um, obviously take a lot of conversation and a lot of uh, investigation and input. Um, so usually that's best for a, a board or a committee to do, to then make a recommendation to the council. Um, looking at the agenda, the first thing uh, to do here, this is actually the first uh, committee meeting this year for the Economic Development Committee. We have some new members, uh, so just wanna welcome them. Uh, it's myself, I'm Steve Goleev, I'm the chair of uh, the committee as well as the town council. We have Randy Jackson, who was a former counselor and someone who's very involved in 
uh, assisting the community's growth in many areas. Uh, Matt Bragdon, who is also uh, a town councilor, Peter Jamison as a town manager, uh, Jessica Massey, who uh, works for Design Lab uh, and also does a significant amount of work uh, for the community in, in many areas. Um, so just thank you to all those committee members who uh, are willing to spend your time and effort on the various projects that we are going to embark on. Um, the first item I, I have here is something that I'm going to be asking all of the committees to focus on, um, basically <clears throat> defining their role, um, a mission statement, so to speak, so that it's very clear what their purpose and intent is, uh, not only for themselves, but for the community itself. Uh, we just had our first sustainability committee of the year yesterday as well, where we did that. Um, I was planning on just sending out a, uh, a sentence or two to everyone to kind of review for the next um, meeting. Just wanted to introduce that idea. Uh, and also clarifying the roles of committees in the process, because I think there's some con confusion in the public uh, on what the role of committees are. And I kind of spoke to that earlier. Um, some of the language that I wrote on that, just to share it though, um, the committee will make recommendations to the town council for discussion and approval of any policies, procedures, or actions that may result from committee discussions. All committee meetings are public meetings that must be appropriately uh, that must appropriately notify the public of meeting dates, times, and location. No official action can be taken on behalf of the town of Millinocket in a committee unless approved by a vote at a town council meeting. Um, so that just kind of gives you a summary of the role of a committee. Uh, again, I'll send out that along with a recommended uh, mission statement, so to speak, to the committee members, and we'll have that for our next agenda. Um, one of the only existing items that we're carrying over from the previous Economic Development Committee uh, is a CDBG grant, uh, which is well under its way, finally. Um, and Peter, if you don't mind just speaking to kind of where we're at with that and what it is. <clears throat> so we held the bid opening um, as part of that process recently. And given the timeline of events there, um, you know, the, with the original budget done pre-COVID, um, the overall cost of the project ended up being about double uh, the original cost. So within that project, the two major pieces were um, the downtown lighting along uh, Penobscot Avenue uh, with, with dark sky in mind. Um, and then the uh, second major piece was um, electrical infrastructure within Bedard's Park, um, which included additional lighting structures. Um, you know, uh, presentation type lighting, uh, you know, focused on our memorial that is uh, at the top of the park, and then additional uh, electrical outlet access for, you know, vendors and, and sound equipment for certain festivals and, and, and the like. Um, so given the budget and the available funds after, um, after the contract <clears throat> or after the bid had come in, um, we looked at the two major pieces and the contractor that, that had bid on the process was kind enough to uh, separate the aspects of both of those projects. And the decision that we made was to move forward with the improvements in Veterans Park um, as it would have, as we felt it would have a much more impactful and, and, and positive effect for uh, the community as a whole. Uh, so that conversation has started the go ahead has been given to our um, project management engineer uh, firm out of Bangor uh, we should have more information on uh, on the associated dates of uh, start and completion here in the near future thank you Peter um, are there any comments from anyone on any of what's been discussed so far All right, um, so that'll be just a continuous item that will be brought up. We'll basically be giving updates on that. Um, it's already gone through approval process from the council quite some time ago. It's basically just a, uh, a maintenance piece at this point of keeping on top of the, uh, the project. So we'll give updates here as well as 
on the council level. If I could add just one more thought on that, I, I, what I failed to mention was the, um, you know, we, we still recognize that the downtown lighting portion of that project is still important to uh, the community and, and certainly with the dark sky in mind and the astro tourism uh, industry, which is, which is large and growing. Um, so that, you know, we will likely be seeking additional funds to uh, tackle that part of the project you know, moving forward as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and with that, uh, it brings us to new items. Um, obviously there's a couple of new items here on the agenda. These are ones that I would imagine would take uh, multiple meetings. So those will be um, some of the new items that will be taken on, but I also wanted to open it up to the public if there's any recommendations or ideas that anyone would like this committee to pursue. So if anyone has any thoughts, please feel free to share. Can I just make a quick comment? Um, I shared the Our Katahdin update. It's a YouTube video that talks about the successes over the past year, just from an economic development perspective. Um, there's a lot of work that's happening in parallel with the work that's being done by the town. I'm on the board of Our Katahdin, so I just wanted to use this opportunity to let everyone know about all the good things happening um, in addition to what's happening at the town level. Thank you. Yes, and that video was was uh, pretty incredible, uh, documenting all the all the all the small wins uh, and and work that had been done. Um, a lot of the I know a lot of the, a lot of the work that's done there isn't necessarily seen by the the general public every day, but it's good to have a recap like that that explains all the work in the background. Yeah, and a big thank you to Arkatadan and all those involved in a lot of efforts to revitalize our economy. So thank you to Arkatadin. And um, as I said earlier, Jess, you've really contributed a lot um, in the region in so many different ways. You wear many hats just like a lot of us do and uh, your work is very appreciated. Um, on that video, I'll, I'll uh, request to get a link to that YouTube video on our she website. In the chat. Yeah, I see you shared it in the chat, but I'll see if we can get it on the website as well in our committee page so that uh, people in the committee or uh, others can reference that or access it. Any other suggestions or comments before moving on to the next item? All right. Uh, so the next item is the four main downtown project. Um, I know that Jane and Ann and uh, Peter have and I have been in correspondence on this. Um, Anne, I'd like to introduce you, though, um, if you wouldn't mind just giving an introduction to yourself and the, the project. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Anne Ball, and I'm a program director at Maine Development Foundation. I oversee the Maine Downtown Center, uh, and I have since uh, 2017. Um, and prior to that, I was a contractor at MDF uh, working on special projects, and um, long ago, um, Millinocket was a member, a official member of the Maine Downtown Center. It was called the Network Program at that time, uh, which is part of the National Main Street Program. Um, and uh, I, I recently looked at those materials um, and it was interesting to reflect back and of course see how much has changed with uh, everything going on in Millinocket. So my role with you guys at this point in time is that, uh, the four main project, which um, probably you all have heard of, the Forest Opportunity Roadmap, is a two-phase, multi-year uh, funding effort from the Economic Development Administration, uh, which was really put forth by Senator Collins um, and Senator King when they realized that Maine, in a very short period of time, had had large mill closures uh, in 10 communities. And so Millinocket is one of those communities that has benefited from the four main work over the last uh, five, almost six years. Um, specifically, there's been a communities component, which is where kind of I entered the room, which has been largely led by Robert O'Brien. Uh, and it's involved um, some housing work, it's involved uh, some leadership work, um, and some of you, I think, are participating. Peter, are you in the ICL class right now? I am in the ICL class. I'm also on the Forming Communities Committee. Thank you. So you, 
you could recap the work of the communities committee better better than I can. Um, but it's been a, a collaborative process with all of these 10 communities. Uh, and in addition to housing and uh, leadership, there's a downtown component. So that's kind of where I enter the room. And we are basically working with, I think it's seven of the 10 communities that have chosen to participate in thinking about their downtown uh, as an asset to mill site redevelopment um, or they want to think about it as an asset for um, recreational tourism. I mean, everybody's approaching it a little bit differently. Everybody's downtown assets look a little differently. So in the fall, I traveled with uh, Robert O'Brien and Joanna Crisp, and we came up and met with you guys and, uh, you know, walked around uh, for uh, a morning and developed a little bit of a report, very high level, and thought, okay, let's see if Millinocket would like to talk about re-engaging a group to focus on uh, their downtown as an asset to economic development. So that's kind of the purpose of why I'm here. I'm not here to uh, lead your committee. I'm not here to um, you know, set agendas. I'm, I'm here for probably a year just to sit here and do a few things. Uh, listen, observe, connect you with resources, bring up ways to think about some of the issues you might be dealing with as it pertains to the downtown and economic development. Um, I'm not going to create work for you. I'm going to try to provide opportunities for you. And in the process, we have uh, a mini downtown grant of $2,000. So this group can think about how they would like to use that money. Um, and, you know, our goal is obviously to kind of see this group gel and have maybe it's sub conversations, maybe it's not your full economic development committee um, that would really focus on downtown and what downtown needs. So that is my purpose in being here. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Anne, and, and thank you for your interest in assisting us. Um, the downtown is definitely an area that the council and the community has thought a lot about. Um, and to have further resources uh, through your organization and your, your personal help uh, would be very appreciated. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions for Anne? Yeah, Celeste? Hi, um, I'm Celeste Bard. Um, I'm just curious, are there any restrictions on how the, you said there was $2,000 in a mini grant, are there any restrictions on how that might be used? Does it need to be matched with anything? No, nothing, okay. no restrictions. I mean, I think, you know, we would like it to be something related to the downtown. Um, a number of principles come with kind of downtown work, you know, quick wins or incremental change, something that is, you know, something small that can grow to something else. Um, and part of, I think, my role is to overlay some of those principles into your conversations and your thinking. Uh, the big National Main Street program, of which there are over 2,000 communities that have formal Main Streets and affiliates. Uh, in Maine, we have 10 Main Streets and 13, 14 affiliates. Um, those organizations are uh, working in this four-point approach, it's called. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. And it really focuses on you know, good design, having a strong organization, uh, looking at economic vitality and a good mix in your downtown, uh, and then looking at promotion and events. And you have all that stuff going on already. So um, I, I think it's a matter of kind of overlaying it into that work, um, Celeste. So no, no, no restrictions or match. <laughs> And it's not a lot of money, I recognize that. I wish it could be more. Thank you, Celeste, and thank you, Anne. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Jane. Good to see you, Anne. Um, I know, I wish Randy Jackson was on the call today because I know he was the one that you sort of did a downtown walkthrough and gave you a tour. And um, you mentioned this may or may not be um, the group that you do a, a little bit of work with, I guess we will we figure that out going forward. Do you want to just join these meetings for a little bit or do you want to create um, a subgroup that's specific to downtown revitalization? I want what works for MDF? Well, anything works for us. We want it to work at the local level. It is about you guys driving these conversations and this work. So I will overlay with whatever works. Um, you know, that that is totally up to you. 
not, I'm not trying to pass the buck. I literally nope. want it to be a local solution. Um, and the other thing I should say is that during this year I spend with uh, your group, um, we will obviously have uh, a, another one or two in-person site visits, and we will also be having a gathering of the seven four main communities that are currently looking at their downtowns together for some peer um, learning as well, and that will be in the spring, and we will cover, you know, mileage or hotel if it requires that type of travel. So those are kind of two other components. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any other comments or questions? Well, I would say, Anne, it, it might be helpful for us to compile some of the work that we've done up until this point regarding the downtown and kind of start from there. Uh, we've had, um, you know, we've had a couple tours of the downtown and various, you know, grant opportunities we've had and uh, focused on specific design issues. The town at one point had a revolving loan fund uh, to assist with facade or other types of improvements. Um, so I think there's a lot to revisit that would probably serve us to recap that and then see uh, what the next best steps are. Is that something that you think would be appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have probably seen some of those documents in my time at MDF, but I would love if there is, you know, if they're on a website somewhere, just uh, send me the link or the documents. Um, it is a great jumping off point. We never want to uh, take you backwards. We would like to, you know, take planning and say, all right, well, this is still a goal. Uh, is everybody in agreement? How are we going to get there? So uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I, I envision this process as, as being hopefully something to catapult all of the work that we've done now into an actionable, uh, you know, actionable plan, something that we can really do something from. Because just like I'm sure you're familiar with, there's like with any other um, issue that a town or organization focuses on, there's so many isolated uh, projects and little, you know, things here and there that seem pretty scattered and I think bringing it all into one picture could be really beneficial and, and then come up with a plan for there. So that's kind of my thinking. I think that sounds great. And I think you'll be surprised that all those little projects you're talking about actually together create this kind of comprehensive work you're already doing. Um, so I think you'll be surprised. And thanks, Jess, for those uh, links. I will put those on my laptop. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments on this? All right, well, recommended next best step, uh, next best steps, excuse me, I've been tongue twisted for a while here. Um, I would say that probably keeping this within the committee is, is a good choice, um, especially since it's been started here. I, I think continuing it here is good. Uh, then we can work on this over the, the following or this year and then make some recommendations to the council and involve different council members and, and the public on the council level as well, so that there's multiple ways of hopefully drawing people into the conversation. And part of the conversation could be also obviously how we engage with the public uh, better and open it up to more input. Sounds great. I'm looking forward to spending time with you all and uh, you know seeing where it goes. Thank you, ma'am. All right, well, with that, um, that brings us to our probably least controversial item on the agenda, which is the short-term rentals. Um, again, I appreciate everyone showing up. Um, I know that there are some uh, feelings and thoughts behind this that uh, many people have throughout the community. I just wanna preface kind of where we're at and why it's being discussed here before getting into it. I think it would just be helpful. Um, as many of you know, the planning board had taken up the issue and recommended uh, to the council an ordinance. Um, the ordinance had uh, basically uh, looked at the registration of, uh, of short-term rental owners or operators. Um, it defined uh, potentially a little too loosely what a short-term rental is, um, what the intention of the ordinance was for. Um, there's the language uh, on the website. So if some of you had accessed this meeting through the town website under the committee page, 
Um, that's where you can find the language of the ordinances. Took me to share this screen. Uh, sure. We're going to share a screen with that language as well. Um, you'll see the original ordinance that the council reviewed. The council chose not to uh, take on this ordinance. Um, some of the concern was the language itself um, being either too vague or just not really fitting what, what the council felt would be um, obviously something worthy to vote on uh, or in favor of. <clears throat> You'll see two different documents here. Is it shared right now? Yeah. Okay. Can you all see the documents? Okay. Um, one of them to the right with the red uh, was from a specific counselor who offered some suggestions, which I think was pretty universally shared amongst the other counselors. Uh, to the left is the original ordinance that um, I can scroll down to the language. So, oh, well, I guess you can see the difference anyway with the red. Um, the reason it's being sent over to the committee after um, initially not approving the ordinance is because uh, a, the uh, planning board does not focus, or at least is not set up to focus on economic aspects of the ordinances. They really focus more on zoning. Um, so that's one reason the Economic Development Committee is looking at this. The other reason is because uh, just like the planning board, these kinds of discussions and decisions may take some time and uh, hosting them at a council level um, could really impose on uh, a lot of the other issues and items that we focus on. Um, so it's been brought to this committee to review it again and to make a recommendation after taking into consideration what the planning board has reviewed. Um, so in looking at that, um, basically we're here to discuss what the economic impacts could be, how we can clean up the language to hopefully make it more specific or more broad based upon what the input is. Um, and the purpose of the Economic Development Committee is obviously to support economic development. Um, so just to make it clear, we are not here to impose any kind of restrictions necessarily that would inhibit economic development. Uh, quite the opposite, we're here to support economic development. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I would like to open it up to anyone's comments or feedback before getting into it. Um, I propose that we'll just look, read through the ordinance and uh, talk about what changes specifically, maybe paragraph by paragraph, uh, we might want to have. Uh, are there any initial thoughts, though, from anyone here? Steve? Yes, Tyler. Yeah. Um, one comment that I have heard uh, um, some concern of is reference to current zoning laws prohibiting um, commercial uh, establishments in sections of the town. Uh, the uh, current, I don't think the current uh, zoning laws are keeping up with the practices in some of these areas. Is this going to be addressed in reference to where you can have a uh, short-term rental? I think that it should be addressed in the sense that we need to have the planning board then review any of those specific items alone. I mean, yes, um, we can make any recommendations to the council. The council could then decide to send, obviously, that to the planning board to review. But I would say that these would be in a different, uh, a different process. Yeah, and I would say that some of the uh, zoning code violations and not dealing with short-term rentals, but, but is long-term rentals. So it's, it's more than just this subject matter. That is correct. Um, on the manager support, we are, we are going to have a straw poll of making some uh, uh, requests from the planning board regarding that specifically, actually. So um, tomorrow we will be discussing that. Any other initial thoughts before diving into it? Okay, so I'm gonna go paragraph by paragraph here, and then uh, we can discuss each section 
uh, kind of what the implication of each section might have, how it might be changed to uh, clean up the language or even eliminate the language, depending on what we uh, discuss here. And then at the end, kind of having an overview. Um, so I'm going to start first with the purpose. And I'm reading off the original document, not the uh, revised one. The purpose uh, for the ordinance is the use and intent of this ordinance is to ensure that any home-based short-term rental business operates in a manner that respects the neighborhood in which it is situated. This ordinance allows short-term rental operations in residential dwelling units in the R1 zone with the intent of protecting the quality of life of the surrounding residential neighborhood for unreasonable or unsafe intrusions and nuisances inappropriate to a residential setting. Does anyone have any comments or feedback on that first paragraph? Yeah, Celeste. You're muted, Celeste, we can't hear you. Um, just a little background. Um, we have an architecture business and um, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I read through it. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, that I think could be really problematic because, you know, when you're changing zoning, um, it has a huge implication on the community. And so I think, um, you know, while the town wants to be supportive of a resurgence and people who are investing in the community, it's a balancing act and it's not give away everything to create this opportunity to change zoning because people who have been living in these neighborhoods have certain rights to when they purchase property to not expect there to be, you know, a, a commercial business next door. And um, I think anyone I did hear, I sat in on a few of these meetings, but I did hear somebody say that it's not a business. And yeah, try to say that to the IRS if you're collecting money uh, from from the income and tell the IRS that this is not a business. So I think, I think the language and the terminology really needs to be clear. Um, there needs to be a clear idea of the impact on the zoning. And usually if there are zoning changes, um, it's something that's actually put before the communities that, you know, the people that live in these neighborhoods and there's input and it's just, it's a whole process and it's, it doesn't just happen in a, um, you know, just in a, in, a, in a meeting like this, I guess that would be my first reaction to that. But there is, you know, and there's also, if you're running a business, you have a responsibility to meet code. And, um, and then, you know, there's just a, there's a lot involved. So it's just not, it's not, I mean, there is, and there's also a difference between somebody who's just renting out a room to earn extra income and somebody who's actually running a full-time, you know, hotel. And I will say that we, we do a short-term rental in Millinocket, but I understand both sides of the argument. Thank you, Celeste. I, th I think those points are very valid. Um, do you have any specific suggestions on either the first paragraph itself having changes or another process uh, that you think we should also go through as well? I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think you're going to come up with a solution today in, um, you know, in an hour and going through this paragraph by paragraph that's going to be, um, that's going to sort of address the issues that are really, that are uh, put forth. Um, I think, um, obviously, there's going to be a cost to the community of Millinocket, which is trying to rebuild itself. And where, you know, so I did see a line that said there, you know, that no fees would be charged. Well, that's great for the people that are doing the short-term rentals, but there's going to be a cost associated with going in and inspecting these, inspecting these properties. And who's going to bear that cost? Should that really be on a community that already has, you know, a lot of extra costs and they, and they don't have, you know, necessarily the resources to spend, you know, whatever, $100 a unit or something inspecting these units to make sure that they're safe and that they're going to meet code if they're actually, and that's, and that's if the zoning is even appropriate for it. And I think, I mean, there's just so much, <laughs> there's so much in it, you know, using home base. So is this, are we only looking at zone one? Are we looking at all zones throughout the city? Are we including, our business happens to be a commercial business. So does it apply to us? Maybe it doesn't. Should it? Probably. You know, so I just, I think there's just so much that needs to be addressed and I don't think it's going to be the right forum to do it in this format, in my opinion. And 
Um, and I think so it's it's balancing trying to um, both support the economic development, but also understand that there are costs associated with it that the town is going to have to incur and it should be offset somewhere. So I think, I don't know, I just think there's so much about it that really is very complicated and it's just not gonna happen in a one page document in my opinion, but that's me. Thank you, Celeste. And I am gonna to go to other comments shortly. Um, I know other people have things to say. Um, I don't think there's any intention on solving this issue today, as you suggested, um, but I am curious if, if you don't feel that this is the proper format, what do you feel is the proper process? Well, I think we should just hear from other people and then I can weigh back in after because I'm just one voice, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt, I see your hand up. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, so yeah, I, I think this document the way we are approaching it, it, it is right in my eyes although i don't have nearly as much you know background as some other people um the only comment is in response to to the uh, the comment made about payments we currently don't charge to go in and do inspections for houses or for businesses um in town and i think making these quote unquote businesses do that short-term rentals having them pay a fee isn't fair because then we got to go and charge everybody who wants an inspection on their house, everyone who wants an inspection on their apartment building, everybody who wants an inspection on their, their regular business that they run. We'd have to charge them too. Um, that that's not fair. I think it should remain a no fee, like like it uh, it states in the uh, modified document on the right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Any other thoughts or comment? And this is on the first paragraph, of course. All right. Um, well, I, I did hear at least one specific suggestion of the zoning, um, which is not really the purview of this committee, but it does say uh, that it really only identifies units within the R1 zone. Um, there are people who do short term rentals in almost every zone throughout town. Um, so that would be an area that at least I think the committee should recommend to the Council to then ask the planning board to re review that again. Um, identifying only one zone, I don't think really works. Is there any thought on that or anyone disagree? I agree. Thank you, Charlie. Celeste, you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's gonna have a different impact on the, you know, depending upon the zone, because in a commercial zone, it's zoned for commercial use, it's a commercial business, so it's not going to have the same ripple effect. Um, Councillor Bragdon, I appreciate your comment, I, and I agree. You know, um, I think uh, it, you can unfairly charge for short-term rentals. I have no idea how many short-term rentals there are in Millinocket. I don't know if it's 50, 100, you know, 1,000, I don't know. But I think at some point, that is something that the community will have to address if there's an extra burden that's being placed on the fire department or the code enforcement or whoever it is. And so maybe it is. it will have to be an equal, uh, you, you know, equal opportunity across the businesses or the community if, if it becomes burdensome. So I agree with that. Thank you, Celeste. Charlie Srami, I see your hand up. Just a quick answer because there's so many ways of feeling this whole issue. But a quick answer <clears throat> to that last question was during the planning board discussions we had it was pointed out that it was near near 45 to 50 uh airbnbs and the i'll call them airbnbs we're calling it's a tissue name for short-term rentals um 45 to 50 that's the answer to a simple question so uh, i'll leave it at that for now thank you thank you charlie any other comment on the first paragraph All right. So the next paragraph goes into the definition of a short term rental. Uh, short term rentals, uh, the use control management or operation of a dwelling unit in whole or in part for dwelling, sleeping or lodging purposes for periods of fewer than 14 consecutive days for compensation directly or indirectly. Are there any thoughts on that specific section?
Yeah, Celeste. Um, who decides what's what's a nuisance? I mean, is this turning into, uh, you know, so who determines what's a nuisance, what's unreasonable, um, what's inappropriate in a residential setting? Is this referring back to zoning? Um, if then, you know, if some neighbors, neighborhoods prohibit short-term rentals, um, which they probably do in their covenant, it sounds like the new development should be this, you know, there should be some mention of this, that this would not override any restrictions to the covenants or deeds. But this is getting into terminology that a lawyer really should be addressing, you know, and it's, it's a lot of wordsmithing. Thank you, Celeste, and that's a good point. Um, we obviously already have ordinances on the books for noise, odor, different, uh, you know, uses, um, or at least activities that can go on in different zonings. Um, one of my suggestions at the last council meeting was that um, if it's an issue of worrying about uh, uh, people coming in and not following the ordinances, that perhaps each zone, uh, each area that is zoned differently, should have the local ordinances in the uh, in the unit itself, to where they can see after 9 p.m. there are noise restrictions. Before 9 a.m. there are noise, and I'm just making up that number. Uh, that there's uh, you know order ordinances as well, and and things like that, so that at least um, to cover the uh, person who's operating the Airbnb. Um, they can say that their, their, their <clears throat> clients or tenants, whatever you want to call them, uh, were appropriately notified of these things. Um, that was just a su suggestion that I had. Um, Matt Bragdon, your hands up. Yeah, I was just going to agree with Celeste. I, I definitely agree that a lawyer should look at this and there should be definitions in here for what a nuisance is, even though we have ordinances and everything. That, that says it indirectly. I think it needs to be directly mentioned here because we do have some people from out of state that have Airbnbs that aren't going to go every sing through every single one of the ordinance to find out what they can and can't do. I think a nuisance needs to be defined here, and I think it needs to be very clear on what can and can't be done. So I, I definitely agree that a lawyer should take a look at this and and really you know lay down what we what we should do. Thank you, Matt. Celeste. Um, yeah, and I think to to back up what Matt is saying, I mean, it really you, you don't. In my opinion, you don't want to turn it into a police issue where the police has to make a determination. And it's like they you just do not want to be operating at that level at a town as a town. And so there just needs to be really clear guidelines so that, you know, people can continue to live their lives and raise their children and do whatever, you know, whatever they need to do in their every, everyday lives and not be impacted by um, by the businesses that are operating near them. And that's why that's why you have zoning. That's why you don't have pig farms next to residential you know residential developments and that's why some zoning is really restrictive i mean probably not in millinocket but some zoning you know or some ordinances within or covenants within housing developments you've got to it's, it's got to be a certain square footage it's got to have this kind of siding you can't have a clothesline i mean all of that is to protect the community and so that's what we're talking about is just protecting the community that exists and and balancing that with the with the interest of people who are trying to be part of the revitalization. Thank you, Celeste. Charlie Prey. Yeah, we at the council meeting we talked about uh, when businesses um, registered uh, with the town that they were going to operate. We would provide them those guidelines. We would provide them also the local services the the uh, numbers to, for ambulance and police and all that type of thing that we might provide or require them or ask them to post in that, which would tell the person uh, renting or purchasing the uh, nights at a, at a uh, short-term rental, they would have that prescribed out to them. And we also talked that that would be basically enforced by the code enforcement officer, uh, not the police department, but the police is there to back up the um, code enforcement officer if needed. And that's one of the things that our, pre our last code enforcement officer said is if he got a complaint on something that was being rental, he didn't know where to go to get a hold of the owner. So that's, remember, that's kind of what drove this whole thing to start with. Thank you, Charlie. Any other comments?
Okay. Uh, so what I heard from everyone then is uh, defining what a nuisance is and potentially reaching out to a lawyer to look at the language here. Um, the next section is uh, A, short-term rental registration is required within the town of Millinocket. A registration application is available at the code enforcement office or town office. Um, one of the suggestions from a counselor added at the end of that sentence, at no fee to the business. Are there any uh, comments on that line? Yeah, Celeste, then Matt. Um, if you're going to do at no fee, I don't think it needs to be in that because if that changes over time and there needs to be a fee and it's going to be spread throughout the whatever businesses or homes that are asking for an inspection, then you'd have to go back and change this ordinance. So you can just not have it in there and not charge a fee, in my opinion. Thank you, Celeste. Matt? Uh, I was going to say some some way. I don't know if it needs to be listed that we have to have no fee, especially with Celeste, that if, if it does come down to it that we have to change the policy, uh, I mean, it could easily be amended, but um, I just don't see a point of it being there. I mean, once they go to the town office and they pick up the application, if they have a question, they can always ask. Thank you, Matt. Brandon? Hey, everyone. Um, I haven't met most of you before, but I'm, my name is Brandon. I'm originally from the Bar Harbor area, but uh, have a couple of short-term rentals up in Millinocket. Um, anyway, um, one thing I noticed is that uh, this application is not available online. Is there a reason for that, or is that uh, on purpose? Yes, it's because there is no ordinance in place. So if there were an ordinance, if this were in effect, then there would be an application. But there's nothing enacted yet, so there is no process for this. Right, but it does is the application going to be available online if this does get passed? If this does get passed by the council, then yes, it would be available um, most likely online as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Celeste? Um, I do have another comment about the 14 days. I don't know. That seems really short. I mean, because there are certainly short-term rentals that are, you know, 21 days and two months even. Um, if it's taking it off of the long-term market, which I would define as if you're in a long-term rental, it's usually an empty apartment. People have their own furnishings. There's a lease of maybe a year or it's a month, month lease, but people tend to stay as long as they want or until the landlord asks them to leave for some reason. But um, I think there's a lot of uh, gray between 14 days and what might be a typical year lease. And so, you know, I don't know where the 14 days comes in, but I think that that deserves more discussion. That's something that can definitely be reviewed. I know that um, a lot of insurance companies look at a minimum of six month rentals. After the six month mark, then you're considered a long term rental. Um, I don't know if we want to go by insurance uh you know verbiage like that or if we want to look at something else but um that is a good point does anyone have any comment on the amount of days yes brandon i believe that's a uh tax implication where it's not considered uh like if if you have a primary residence and you rent it out for fewer than 14 days in a year then it's not considered a business whereas if it's more than that then it is just in my own personal research not a lawyer or anything thank you brandon any other comment, Charlie? Right. Yeah, just to back up what Brandon said, that is, that's, uh, I think that's tax law. I think that's both state and federal. Uh, for the comment earlier about somebody running out a room to a roommate type of thing, it, it gets around the, uh, the income reporting. Thank you, Charlie. And I will point out that any rental at all uh, has to still be inspected by, uh, the town, whether it's long term or not. So there already is inspection, there already are inspections in place, just to point that out. Um, any other comment on that? Okay. Um, so I heard some feedback on A that that may not be uh, basically necessary to say at no fee to the business. Um, is that a general consensus for now? I have no problem with that, but I will say that it was added because we had a lot of concerns about the fact that we would be charging a fee. 
and it was to alleviate those businesses that were concerned about an unknown fee as to what size it would be and so forth to have the inspection, <coughs> excuse me, to have an inspection. <coughs> Thank you, Charlie. Okay. So at least in my notes, I'm going to remove at no fee to the business from A. Um, we'll obviously revisit this document um, another time, but for, for today's purposes, I will clear that out. Um, for B, the line is, there is a one-time life safety inspection by the town's life safety inspector, but if a complaint is filed, a follow-up inspection will be scheduled. Are there any thoughts on that line? Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm also looking at the revised at the same time, and I like the idea of there being a safety inspection. I definitely think that it's necessary at least once. However, I don't agree with um, having to go back every single time there's a complaint. Um, there could be a guest that's extremely upset with, with how things went with the, the owner of the building, and he puts in a bad complaint with the town, and the town goes and there's nothing wrong with the building. I, I've had that happen um, with one of the properties I help maintain. Um, I think it should be either one and done, or if the same complaint is entered at a minimum of three times, then a life safety inspection is initiated and required. I don't think it should be uh, one complaint warrants uh, another investigation. I just don't think that's fair. Thank you, Matt. Celeste? Um, this is probably moving into, it kind of overlaps into the next issue, but um, I think the town needs to be extremely careful that it not state something like, you know, it can only go in when it's life-threatening because there are plenty of instances that you would want to be able to go in and shut things down before it is life-threatening. I mean, that's just way too late to wait um, until there's a life-threatening event. If it, if there are code violations, if there are, you know, health, life and safety issues, it doesn't have to be life-threatening. That's just way too dramatic. Um, and I think, you know, there's really no reason that there couldn't be a follow-up every three years or some, I mean, something like that. I mean, if they're operating a business, you know, or, or whatever. I understand what you're saying, Councilor Bragdon, and, and, and there is that to consider. Um, but I think it's also the responsibility of the town to not tie your own hands so that if there are issues that come up that you are not suddenly able to do anything because, oh, well, you know, it's really, it's, it's terrible, but is it life-threatening? Who determines that? I mean, is lead paint life-threatening? Is, you know, if not, not having enough egress life-threatening, you know, but it's just, I think there just needs to be, it just needs to be clearly defined. And I think this is also an area that you wanna be extremely careful uh, to, cause you do have a responsibility to balance the safety with, um, you know, obviously wanting to uh, allow some economic development. So I think this just, this really needs a rework and I would, I would not recommend putting that in. It, not in the condition it is right now, at least not, not stated the way it is. Thank you so much. I wish Patrick, Patrick, I'm not an architect, Patrick is, he was not able to make this meeting, but he can speak much more eloquently to it um, to explain uh, why, why it's important that, that the language be very, um, allow the town to, to do what it needs to do and make, and make judgment calls at some point. Thank you, Celeste. And, and Patrick is definitely always uh, invited to submit comment, whether it's before, or during, or after. Uh, committee meeting. So if, if he has any suggested language changes, uh, I think that is something that we would all like to look at. Um, well, that goes for everyone as well. Members of the public uh, at large are able to uh, provide those comments before before any meetings if they're not able to attend formally, not maybe on social media. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, your hand was up. Yeah, um, just to follow up on Celeste's comment, I think we do need to be very specific here on what the Life and Safety Board is looking for. I, don't, I haven't seen anything or heard anything about what specifically they're looking for and how this inspection is gonna be conducted. Um, just in my experience from the town of Bar Harbor, they've got a pretty robust website set up for all this stuff and they also require inspections and they require one every three years and they've got everything published on their website, exactly what they're gonna look for uh, you get a, a, a card once it's complete saying that they've passed in, um, and th that they've paid their fee because they do charge a fee um, and they they come back and do it every three years. So 
if that's something people are interested in, I'm happy to post the link to that in the chat so you can see what they're looking for. Um, and maybe we can discuss further whether or not every three years or how often we want to do this, whatever makes sense for the town. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, and I will point out, I see your hand up, Matt. I will point out that uh, all, all places, as I mentioned earlier, are required to go through an inspection anyway. Um, so adding this line here doesn't really change that process. Um, this just adds basically language to the specific issue of a short-term rental since it's being newly defined. Um, but also if any residents in town or business has any complaint filed against them, um, it is the responsibility of the town to follow up on it anyway. So this isn't really creating anything new, it's just stating um, the obvious or what already exists, which is if there is a complaint, then that will be an additional time that uh, life safety inspector will come uh, to view the, the residents or the business. Uh, Matt, your hand was up, and then Celeste. Uh, thanks. First off, I want to thank Brandon for including that STR in the chat that I was going to ask if you had that checklist. I'm interested to see how we, uh, we, we can pull information from that. Um, and I agree with Celeste. I think it's, I think the, the, the way it's written right now is extremely flawed. It needs to be, it needs to be removed and completely rewritten. Um, I, I definitely agree with the three year uh, inspection. I think that if other towns are doing it, I think we should do it too. I think it's a great way to get around that uh, going in every single time there's a complaint and still having that, uh, like you had said, um, if there's a complaint, we still have to go anyway. It's, it's still the town's burden to ensure that there's no issues. Um, but that, that was my comment as I agreed with what she had said. Thank you, Matt. Celeste? Um, I think if, it, if it's going to refer back to other portions of the um, you know the town's ordinances then it probably should just be referred back to because otherwise people may look like look at a document like this and think it's inclusive so you know because you know is everyone really going to read the town ordinances or you know, probably not right so I think it just needs to if it's referring back to some other restriction then it needs to be you know at least noted um noted there so yeah and i think it's just it's a matter of keeping options open for people who do need to because you know there always are going to be you know you know things happening where somebody might not be running a safe short-term rental and the town needs to have some teeth to be able to to you know to close it down or restrict it um without being too limiting thank you celeste Rich had asked a question in the chat here. How many complaints is the town getting? I don't have statistics on that. So I wouldn't know. Our, our last code enforcement officer is not uh, working for the town anymore. I think he would have been the one who would know. Uh, but we also don't have a list of who the short-term rental operators are. So we don't really know if it's a short-term rental or not uh, that any complaints may have been made against. Did you have any follow up on that though, Rich? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of confused if it seems to be such an issue with the town getting complaints from people that are renting the Airbnbs. It would seem that they would that this would have come up a long time ago. I know that <clears throat> with Airbnb or HomeAway, if a if a um, customer that's staying with you has a complaint, they're going to complain to Airbnb. They're going to complain to VRBO. They're, they're going to make a point of, of writing a bad review to say that X, Y, and Z wasn't safe, whatever the case may be. And, you know, when I look down through the, the comments and the, the reviews, if you will, on the website, what I'm finding from the vast, vast majority of the owners of Airbnbs in Nolan Ocket is they're getting rave reviews. You know, they're getting really good reviews. If there was a problem, I assure you, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the person staying with you is going to make is going to make a complaint no different than with an airline or a hotel or anything else. So it just doesn't seem like it. I haven't seen where it's been a problem. That's that's all. That's why I'm asking the question. I guess. I think the confusion on that ridge comes from just you know a confusing statement that may have been made earlier in the meeting regarding where the complaints were coming from. Um, I think that you're absolutely right that you know the, the people who stay there if they have a complaint. 
um, are you know leaving reviews and and you know with the with the owner of the property directly. I think the the complaints that come to the town of Villanocket are from the neighborhood, not necessarily the guests of that specific rental. And that would that would make more sense. And I will add to that though, um, even if even if there are um, at least from the business perspective, some um, some avenues of um, calling out, you know, a, a negative experience that doesn't translate into a change on the local level. We don't monitor feedback as a town on these websites. If there's a safety issue, that is the responsibility of the town. We're the ones that respond to emergencies. Or we're the ones who respond to, you know, people being injured or having other issues. So. Although there might be, from a business perspective, like I said, a way for people to try and, and you know, call out some bad practice or something that's unsafe, that really doesn't help us address it, which we really have a responsibility to do. Uh, Matt, your hand is up. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off what you said. Um, you know, I, I agree that Airbnb and VRBO have a great network to, to do reviews, but one, not everybody leaves a review. And two, there's more than just Airbnb and uh, VRBO. You know, I, I know five, a dozen people right now that post their, their listings on Facebook Marketplace, on Craigslist, on places that don't have that, 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 that net, that safety net that VRBO and Airbnb have. Um, so it, I think it is our due diligence as a town to have this in place as a safety precaution. Um, you know, like Steve said, it, it, it is our responsibility. Um, and to answer your question, I, me personally, I know of five people that have complained and yes, they were all, all from neighborhoods, you know, it's about parking this or noise this. Um, I haven't heard of anything negative from anybody who's stayed. Um, but most of the complaints that I've heard have been from people that live in the neighborhood. Thank you, Matt. And, uh, just to point out, I see two hands up. If there are no issues, there won't be an inspection. It's really that simple. If it's safe and everyone's having a good experience, you have nothing to worry about. This just makes it so that we have a way to respond if there is a significant issue. Um, Celeste, and then Brandon. Um, yeah, thank you. I would agree that um, that you know the thing is about the the way Airbnb um, rating systems and complaints will work. What people who aren't involved should understand is that. Um, there are ways around not getting those bad reviews. If you think somebody's going to write a bad review, guess what? You don't write them a review and they don't get to post their review. So it's not to say that it's not happening. It's just that the people who are operating the Airbnbs are savvy enough. If they know that there's going to be a complaint, they might not write a review because they might not want to see their own bad review. So just an FYI for the people in the community who aren't doing Airbnb, I think what's really important and if we're really talking about rebuilding the economy of Millinocket, it's really important that the neighborhoods continue to have a voice. And it's, you know, and it's not gonna be, you know, who, who, what is, what is the, what is the protocol if there is a problem with one of these Airbnbs beyond, yeah, it's important to have a phone number to call, but they, there just needs to be an understanding. People need to understand how they can also protect their own quality of life in their neighborhood where they're investing and, and building their lives. So it's just, it's a balancing act. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, Brandon, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, um, just to follow up on, on Celeste's comment real quick. I believe with Airbnb, the reviews, if you don't leave them a review, they can't see your review, but it still gets posted to your account. So, but there is some back and forth there about, you know, uh, if you think someone's gonna leave you a bad review, because they had an issue, you give them a refund, you, you know, so there are ways uh, to sort of uh, counteract that. Um, but I, I have to say that uh, I think I'm uh, at least partially guilty for starting this entire conversation. Uh, we own a short-term rental on Highland Ave and there was a parking complaint there last year. And I believe it was Richard Agnotti that said that he was not able to get a hold of the owner, me, uh, because my address listed on the town site was a mail forwarding address or something. Um, which that that is the case. I was posted overseas for a long time, so I have a, a, a mail forwarding service down in Florida. Um, but I do get mail there, and he was able to contact me if he chose to do so, but he did not, and so I found out in sort of a roundabout way. Um, but I do think that brings up a good point of having people register, having this contact info available, um, so that if there is an issue, people can 
the owners. And then the final thing I'll say is that um, one thing that's very important is for all the owners to have their own rental agreements that they put in place with guests that come because as much as people like to think that Airbnb and VRBO have your back when it comes to a complaint or an issue, safety or otherwise, they absolutely do not. <laughs> they provide you a platform and a service of bringing guests to the town and to your rental, but they are not going to bat for you legally. So it's important that everybody has their own structure in place for that. Thank you, Brandon. That is helpful for those who don't operate uh, to understand. Um, and something that Celeste had kind of brought up uh, caused me to, to think about it. Um, and I really appreciate, uh, Celeste, your, your comments about kind of maintaining the integrity of certain neighborhoods. Um, when you do buy a home, like you said earlier in this conversation, you have somewhat of an expectation of what your experience will be living in that home. Um, and obviously buying a home is a big deal uh, for many people. And if that neighborhood starts to change and you start seeing the characteristics of that neighborhood affecting what you thought would be a certain way, um, you know, what kind of recourse do those people have? And I think that's a very valid um, concern. Um, so that made me think uh, when we're talking about having teeth to it, um, obviously reasonable uh, teeth to it, um, it, it made me think um, how many complaints warrant action and what is that action? So in other words, if, you know, in a, in a residential area like R1 or in the new development, you know, if, if we're seeing a significant increase in traffic or noise after 9 p.m., um, you know, to where it really does start disturbing the neighborhood, let's say the town gets six or seven complaints over the course of you know a few months, what is the what is the recourse? And that recourse would probably be different than if it were a homeowner, because they're operating very differently. Um, so what would that recourse be? And I, I think that's something that um, we should look at to reassure um, neighborhoods and the people that live in, in them that if it does get to a point that it starts changing the characteristics of their neighborhood. Uh, in such a detrimental way that we will and can do something about it. Um, I kind of want to open that thought up. Jess Massey, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I just want to second what you're saying, um, both Celeste and Steve. I think quality of place is a huge economic development issue. It's why it's here uh, in this committee. And we want to protect the integrity of these neighborhoods. I think short-term rentals are very different than folks who live in the community, pay local taxes, have kids in the school system, and it can change the, the character of a neighborhood. And that's something that we've, it's very valuable here. Um, we need it for growth. We need some, you know, we need lots of long-term rentals as well. If we wanna bring jobs into the community, we need places for workers to, to stay and live. Um, and so we just need to be cautious and try to, you know, economic development's a big umbrella. There's the economic benefit of having short-term rentals and bringing people to town, but there's also a huge economic benefit in having housing stock, regular housing stock, uh, great communities for families to live in um, without undue strain and burden on the character of those communities. So. Thank you, Jess. I very much agree. Um, we did get a message in the chat from Ridge York who said guests can always contact the owner through the app and they also uh, receive the host emails and phone number. Um, just to respond to that, that does not give the town that contact as well. So that's kind of the point of the registration is so that if there is an emergency or there are repeated offenses, so to speak, um, that the town has an appropriate way to contact the owner. Um, any other thoughts or comments on this? Yes, Lucy. Hi, Steve. Um, I, I know that uh, I just have a question and it's along the lines of what Jess raised in terms of long-term rentals also being available. And so I'm just wondering if in the history of considering um, short-term rentals in town, if the committees or if the planning board or if public comment has come up before about any sort of thresholds or indicators in terms of percentage of available housing stock um, 
becoming short-term rental and if that triggers any secondary responses. Um, I know Charlie provided the number that they're 45 to 50-ish uh, short-term rentals now. I think this is a great step in terms of better understanding what short-term rentals are available in town. Um, and then just, you know, with people coming through the doors here at Arcatanen, the question frequently comes up in terms of available housing, either for purchase or for long-term rentals. And so I'm just wondering if that's been part of the conversation regarding short-term rentals so far. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. That's definitely a valid point as well. Does anyone have any comment on that? Yes, Brandon. Uh, just again, going back to my experience down in Bar Harbor, they do have different thresholds for different types of rentals. They actually break it up into VR1s and VR2s. And those types of rentals are either one that is your primary residence and you rent it out for less than, I think it's 30 days a year. And then uh, that's VR1. And then the other one is, is one that's not your primary residence. And so they just recently passed an ordinance in the fall, severely limiting the number of short-term rentals that are not people's primary residence in an, in an effort to make more year-round housing available for people. So that's one thought. Thank you, Brandon. Any other comment on that, Celeste? Yeah, I think it touches upon, I think Jess, and I, that's a great, uh, great insight, Brandon, since you're living in a community or involved in a community that's already kind of farther down the road than Millinock it is. But Jess brings up a really important point. Um, there's just a real housing crunch nationally everywhere. And if we want to build up the community, we need workforce housing. And um, Millinocket, when it was in its heyday, needed all the housing it had. And so if there's, I think, having a percentage of housing allocated to short-term rentals, but capping it at some point or having some understanding of just having it open-ended is going to have an impact not only on the schools, but on the on, on being able to grow the community, um, get people to move to the community and, and aging in place. You know, how do people age in place if they can't, if there's no way to buy, you know, a single family home that they need because suddenly, I'll tell you what we've seen, in, you know, we live in Portland and uh, short-term rentals have really escalated the housing market. It's just gone way, way up. I mean, it's not the only thing, but it's, it's one of many, many reasons that it's become quite unaffordable. And so there's this, there's this ripple effect. And so we at least have to acknowledge the ripple effect that you know, there's a potential negative externality that could be um, impacting the lives of people who are actually trying to live in the community. And we have to take responsibility for it and, and just say, yeah, like it, it does need to be capped at some point so that you know, it's not Disneyland. We're all not living in Disneyland. So anyway, I would just second that. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, Ann Balls uh, offered, uh some uh, links or a link in the chat. <laughs> yeah, it was a little messy, sorry. It split the link in the middle of the sentence, but hopefully you can see the article. Thank you for sharing that though. That, that talks about placemaking, um, kind of going off of what Jess spoke of uh, earlier, but thank you for sharing that. Um, I do think that having a discussion on the threshold or capping short-term rentals would be appropriate. Uh, perhaps not specifically for this ordinance, but something that we can continue discussing in this committee, uh, especially as it evolves over time, um, and something that we should hopefully be a little more expedient on uh, in case you know the properties continue to get bought up for that purpose. It'd be too bad to wait a little long for that. Yeah, Charlie, your hand is up. Yeah, I was just going to mention, Steve, you should mention that the town is doing a housing assessment. We've been looking at the uh, the, uh, the full mix of, uh, of available housing, low income housing, uh, that type of assessment. So while we're dealing with short term rentals here, those other topics are being discussed. Thank you for bringing that up, Charlie. Um, yeah, and, and it really does validate a lot of what uh, Lucy brought up as well. I know she's involved in that housing study. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, unless there's any other comments on the safety inspection. All right. Um, 
it would be nice, as I said, Celeste, earlier, if Patrick wanted to write something up um, to give us an idea. I would think that we would want to mold uh, some of these specifically to the short-term rental rather than referencing other um, parts of the uh, code. They should be probably more specific to short-term rentals is my view. Um, so if, if he is interested in writing anything up, um, please, uh, please do share. Um, under C, if there are any conflicting ordinances involving short-term rental regulation an existing ordinance or zoning, whichever ordinance or zoning is stricter will apply. Um, that kind of really speaks to what I just said. Does anyone have any comment on that? What areas are restricted? What areas are restricted? Well, in the uh, new development, I don't think you can rent out anything short term or long term. Um, other than that, I'm not sure what the other restrictions are. Well, it, it, it seems there would be in there for a reason, right? So is there a particular area that it's restricted? In the new development, when it was created in the 1950s, they wanted no commercial development in that area. So they prohibited uh, any commercial or people building houses for the purpose of renting them out. They wanted individual homes. That really hasn't been looked at since it was established. And it's still called the new development 70 years later. Yeah, and, and that is an area that uh, I referenced earlier at the council will be talking about tomorrow night, um, having the planning board look at that and also the possibility of having or allowing accessory dwelling units um, to hopefully uh, bring up the housing stock a little bit more for rentals in town, long term rentals, that is. Any other comments on that line? I think that line kind of goes hand in hand with everything we're talking about, so I'm sure that will uh still be there and apply a little differently after we revisit the document okay then that brings us to d um, short-term rentals are not permitted in any structure any other structure on the rental property including trailers tents accessory dwelling units separate structures etc without permission from the millinocket planning board or code enforcement i know there were issues uh, that the council had with this line uh, Matt, your hand is up. Yeah, I, I actually spoke about this when they came. This came up at the council meeting. Um, I know of two Airbnbs in town that have uh, that have like mother-in-law suites that are separate from the main structure that are very gorgeous, and um, it, it, it's a separate structure, so it falls underneath this. I don't think they should have to go to the planning board or code enforcement officer to get this approved. I think that if they're going to have a life safety inspection. And the life safety inspector is going to ask, is there anybody staying in that separate structure? And they go and inspect it, and it's fine. I don't think it needs to be approved again by a separate individual or a board of people. And then they have to wait for that approval. Um, I think separate structures should be removed or accessory dwelling. I, I just think it needs a whole workaround. Um, and the Millinocket Planning Board or Code Enforcement Offer, it needs to be one or the other. Um, I don't think it should be both, or it should say or. It needs to be either the Planning Board or either the Code Enforcement Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Any other comments? Yeah, Celeste? So um, again, I would refer back to zoning. They might be beautiful units, but if um, if they're too close to, you know, if they if people are converting garages and it's too close to the neighbor's garage, I mean, there, there are reasons that zoning is the way it is. It's for fire safety and different things. So it should, it should potentially refer back to zoning. Um, I also think, you, you know, what is permission? I mean, it needs to be more legal language. Is it permitting? Um, and you also want to make sure that people aren't just pestering the, the, you know, planning board asking for tent permits or something. I mean, they're just, it's so vague. It's like, it seems like it's going to create a lot of work for the planning board. So it needs to be more specific and then refer back to code and zoning and the things that are set in place to that keep the community, you know, boundaries on on what we can all do in in you know, in the community. Can I follow up with a question, please? Um, you you had mentioned that in the ordinance thing, wouldn't C take effect into that? So if there were sections of town that didn't have that zoning issue, 
um, that didn't implicate with C, couldn't they still use those dwelling units or separate structures? Um, C is there for a reason, obviously. Um, if there is a zoning issue, then C takes into effect and they can't do it. But if there if there is no zoning issue, why couldn't they? Um, I, I just think that it needs to be re reworked. C is there and it says zoning is strict or will apply. Um, so if there is an issue with zoning, wouldn't, wouldn't that take effect anyway? The way it reads, I say yes. I think D should just be entirely eliminated, in my opinion. Um, so I agree. Celeste, your hand is up. You're on mute. You're muted, Celeste. Sorry, Councillor Bragdon, to, to address that, it probably, um, whether it's a long-term rental unit or a uh, short-term rental unit, if, if somebody's converted an accessory dwelling unit or whatever, they would probably need some kind of permitting from the town in order to do that. But then it would fall under whatever umbrella that they're operating, you know, wherever wherever they live, whichever the zoning is for, for where this building is. But whether it's an accessory dwelling unit or a long-term unit, they would still have to go through the same process of just getting a permit to convert or whatever it is they've done would be my understanding. Thank you, Celeste. Any other comment on D? Is everyone okay with eliminating D? Yes. Okay. Um, and then there was a suggestion from a counselor to add an E. Uh, the E says penalty for failure to comply to sections A through D, in this case, A through C, if we eliminate D. Uh, may allow the code enforcement officer or the planning board to pull the short-term rental rentals registration and right to operate as such until compliance is met. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? That kind of speaks to the teeth that we had earlier and perhaps defining uh, what is the penalty for failure to comply, how many, how many complaints or you know maybe we can discuss that but yeah matt your hand is up that that's what i was going to say is that needs to be defined a, a little bit more um what's the penalty what you know indicates there there is a penalty um again my opinion but i don't think it should be the code enforcement officer or the planning board it needs to be one or the other or somebody entirely separate um one or the other is just it, it it's not enough i mean the planning board could say yes the code enforcement officer could say no and then what do you do at that point um it needs to be structured better. Thank you, Matt. I agree. Any any other thoughts on that, Celeste? Um, yeah, I would agree that it needs to be structured better. But I think the way it's written right now, it has pretty much no teeth. So you know, the, the town needs to maintain some control of, over being able to enforce ordinances and whatever. So again, if you know, if it's if this is being referred back to an attorney, that's an area that would be. Um, Good to get. I mean, they're going to look at the whole document. So, yeah. Thank you, Celeste. Charlie? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I had a conversation with the author of that paragraph or sentence. The reason that the code enforcement or the uh, planning board was left or put into that is because the council itself in those earlier discussions hadn't decided how they wanted to go. So both, both proposals were put in there. Second, uh, the town charter sets a penalty for code violation. You can repeat that here. Uh, the current uh, charter has a $100 fine and uh, that's been on the books for 20 years or better, uh, but, but there is a fine. Violations occur on a per day basis. So under the current town code, violations would could be up to $100 a day until you fall into compliance. And of course, if they don't fall into compliance, depending on what it is, I agree it should be the code enforcement officer, not the planning board, because the planning board is five members or three members, and uh, you don't want that many people having to sit down and discuss and have divided votes on how to do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And, and I think you're right about the code enforcement officer. They can also respond quicker, quicker than a board can to certain issues. 
uh, based upon some of that feedback, and Brandon, I'll go to you in just one second, perhaps a schedule of penalties or fees could be created. That way it's very clearly outlined after a certain amount of maybe a certain type of uh, complaint or non-compliance. Um, this is what the penalty will be. Uh, if those penalties continue uh, or those non-compliances continue, then this is the next step and so forth um, that the code enforcement officer will then um, be able to have uh, the teeth, so to speak, to enforce. Um, Brandon, your hand was up. Yeah, just to follow up on, on Charlie's comment, I, I agree with that. And again, my own experience in Bar Harbor, they treat all of this stuff as a violation of the land use ordinance. So if you fail to comply in any fashion with anything there, it just falls right into the land use ordinance penalty system. That way you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You've already got something in place to deal with violations. Thank you, Brandon. Charlie? Yeah, I just wanna thank Brandon for following that too. I have worked with MMA a number of times and I have uh, requested uh, uh, if they could send me a list of various towns that have them. I appreciate you giving us the uh, that information. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Brandon. Um, any other comments on this line? Okay, so perhaps we can look at some of those links that Brandon sent maybe to act as a starting point. Um, does everyone agree maybe so changing, keeping E, but changing it so that it would be just the code enforcement officer uh, who would be allowed to enforce this. Uh, and then perhaps coming up with a schedule of penalties or fees based upon a certain type of attempt, or not attempt, excuse me, of uh, non-compliance. I'm taking silence as agreement. <laughs> okay, so we will uh, then bring all of that into the next meeting. Um, I'll send out a doodle poll for everyone uh, on the committee itself, uh, see what the schedule is, and then uh, we'll post that publicly and make sure that there's enough, uh, obviously enough time for people to be able to move schedules around if they want to attend. Maybe include a reminder for um, the process of, of providing comment ahead of time if, if um, a member of the public is not able to attend the set time of the meeting, uh, because that is, an, a, that is important and an, and an opportunity to weigh in, uh, even if not able to attend in person. Yeah, and uh, sometimes we do schedule meetings just so the public is aware during work hours because there are people that are working in their capacity, such as Anne and others who are here on behalf of their organization. We're not uh, scheduling it in inconvenient times intentionally as some <laughs> members of the public seem to think we do. Uh, we certain, certainly invite as much participation as we can. So we're reflecting the uh, concerns and needs of the community as best as we can. Um, so as Peter said, uh, if you cannot attend, please do submit comments uh, beforehand. Submitting comments is not writing a Facebook post. It is contacting the town, uh, the town being the manager or myself or other counselors or other members of the committee. Um, so thank you, though, for everyone's uh, involvement thus far. Also, please share that with your friends and colleagues who are not in attendance today. Um, that we want that message to be heard loud and clear that we, you know, will continue to excitedly encourage uh, uh, participation and inclusion uh, with, with all committee meetings and council meetings moving forward. The, um, the ability to provide those comments ahead of time uh, in absence of being able to attend uh, is, is a very important part of this process. And on that, um, we only have one more item, really. We already talked about the CDBG grant. Um, so just very quickly, the town survey, uh, something that we've been doing annually. The last chair of the committee, Cody McEwen, um, had been doing that um, fairly well. And, and I just want to say a thank you to him um, for all the work that he's done. The town survey tries to summarize kind of where the community is at, not only looking at um, you know, 
factually where it's at, but also experientially where we're at, how people feel about where we are economically or as a community, and, and it touches many different areas. Um, for those of you who want to see the past uh, surveys and the results of those surveys, it's all on the committee page on our website. Um, so shortly here, we will be discussing um, what our new, uh, or at least this year's survey will look like, what we want to include, what kind of things we want to get a temperature on in terms of the community. So uh, Charlie Sarami, your hands up. Mm, yep, I think you can hear me. Um, I just want to thank you, Steve, for the, having this important conversation about economics. Um, the only thing I want to add is at the beginning of the conversation, you said you had a review of the meeting. And you'll be posting it someplace. Could you uh, be clear on that where that'll be posted so other people that are interested in this particular conversation can follow up on the on the meeting? Sure. Yeah, I'd requested uh, from our manager that we convert these meetings into YouTube videos that can be easily shared. Um, so basically, it's just converting this recording right now into a YouTube video. Once that's done, uh, we can post it on our website um, and then it can be shared from there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts before we conclude? All righty. Well, thank you all for your participation again. Um, and I look forward to further discussions on this. Have a good rest of your work day.